Greetings everybody, it's Overseer Landers and welcome to another Thursday Night Thrive. I hope you've had a great day so far, that your week is winding down. It's time for you to get settled, sit back, enjoy the Word of God and allow it to equip you and empower you to win or empower you to thrive. Amen? Listen, before we get started in the Word, let's take a moment to pray. And in our prayer, we always want to give God the glory for who He is and all that He's done in our lives. I know uh, every day I'm so grateful for His grace and His mercy. And so let's just take a moment and worship Him for a moment, to praise Him, to let Him know I'm so grateful that you allowed me to make it home this day, that I had a job to go to, and that if I didn't have a job to go to, that God has provided for me and opening doors in my future. Let's go before the Lord in prayer. Father, we are so tremendously blessed that you love us and have called us according to a great purpose. I'm grateful, Lord God, for every person who is watching over the airways this Thursday night Thrive Empowerment we declare and decree, Father, in the name of Jesus, that our hearts and minds are ready to receive, that as we enter into uh, this time of, of, of word and worship, that we will understand something will be sown in us, a powerful seed will be engrafted in us, and will produce a kingdom harvest. I pray that someone somewhere, no matter where they're watching this, all over the world, is going to hear a word that will transform them from the inside out. We thank you and praise you in the matchless and mighty name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus the Christ. Let everyone say amen, amen, amen. Well, praise God. Listen, I'm excited about this series that we've been teaching over the last uh, couple of weeks uh, in the month of April. Uh, I want you to understand that God wants you to win. Matter of fact, winning is programmed in your spiritual DNA. And as we started this series in the first week in April, one of the things that we came to understand, it is impactful that we create a better definition of winning. Uh, winning is not about money, it's not about status, it's not about fame or about fortune. It's not about bossing up. Really, winning is coming into submission to your creator, the God that created all of us. Winning is overcoming worldliness. Winning is achieving success in the things that you endeavor to do. Winning is weathering and overcoming the storms of life. And the other part of it, part two, we looked at last week, is understanding that if we're going to win in life, that is living in a constant state of living your best life, you have to win the battle for your soul. We have to maintain vitality in our mind our spirit and our thinking, our imagination and our intellect. All of those things have to be protected in order for us to win. And so today, uh, what I want to talk about and what I want to help us with in understanding that we are designed to win and God's word helps us to win, is it important to know that if we're going to win, we need to understand that there's a battle that we must win. And that is, we need to win the battle of meaning. Uh, what does it all mean? What is the meaning of life? What is the meaning of our existence? What are we after? What are we aiming for uh, in our everyday life? If you don't have that in place, if you don't have a clear, concrete understanding of that, you're going to find yourself very frustrated. Um, and one of the things that really stuck with me on where should I start in scripture to help us understand and win the battle of meaning is the book of Ecclesiastes. And Ecclesiastes in the Old Testament, uh, particularly chapter 1, verses 2 through 4. Now, I'm going to read from the New Living Translation. And so if you get a moment, go ahead and kind of switch over uh, in your electronic devices to the New Living Translation. And here's what Coelith, the preacher, the writer says about the meaninglessness of life. He says, Everything is meaningless, says the teacher. 
completely meaningless. What do people get for all the hard work under the sun? He asked this question. Then he says, generations come and generations go, but the earth never changes. This is powerful. It's powerful because you understand that the writer is posing a question that has been asked throughout the ages. What is the meaning of life? Here's the thing, it eludes many, but it should not escape those who watch this now, follow Christ, or have a kingdom perspective. What does it all mean? If you don't, if I don't, if we don't grasp the meaning of life, life can become this thing that we see through a very jaded lens. Cynicism will rule our thinking, and we'll live with an overwhelming sense of dissatisfaction. This was the kind of tenor of his writings, particularly as he starts out in these 12 chapters in the book of Ecclesiastes. He has a very cynical tone. He has a very jaded perspective of life as a result of, exer of observing things, just sitting back and observing what he saw. If you have a poor sense of self, and we don't have a sense of meaning, we'll have a poor sense of self, our interaction with others, our stewardship of resources are now subject to dysfunction, neglect, and abuse if the meaning in life escapes us. But here's the thing. He, he was looking for meaning, and as he looked for meaning, he observed some things, and he walks through probably chapter 1 all the way through chapter 11, just pointing out several things that he's noticed in life, and one of his favorite subjects or favorite lines was, vanities, vanities, all is vanity. He talks about vanity. He talks about folly. He talks about futility, meaning that so many of our endeavors so many of the things that we try to do, so many of the things that we try to accomplish, when they are measured against what's really important in God's eyes, they are vanity, they are folly. There's seven things I kind of want to bring to your attention that he observed. One powerful thing he says, there's nothing new under the sun. Many of us think that there's new innovative technologies, but when you really boil it down, he says there's nothing new under the sun. Everything that is has already been an idea, it might have been manifest in a different way, but as far as God is concerned. There's nothing new under the sun. He talks about the power of time and the power of seasons. He notices the futility of pleasure. Our life is not always going to be pleasant, and if that's what we're chasing, we're going to find ourselves disappointment. He talks about the folly of labor. Now, don't misunderstand me. He's not saying don't work because it's useless, but he also says it's uh, uh, useless and it is vanity to think that we can build up things for life and leave them and know what someone's going to do with the treasure that we leave behind. He gives the example of someone can work their whole life amass riches and then pass it to a son on air and they squander it all. Follies, follies are the labor of our lives, the futility of labor, the injustices in the world. Uh, we know these injustices right now. We see the injustices that are uh, manifest against people of color in our judicial system. Right now, we're still reeling over the fact that a young man in Sacramento was gunned down by police officers, an unarmed black man gunned down by police officers in his grandmother's backyard, and all he had in his hands was a cell phone, uh, compounded by the fact that police officers, watch this now, are taping this with body cams, but somehow deliberately and conveniently muted them. And all of this leads to more suspicion. It speaks to the injustices that we have to deal with, the injustice of a political system so uh, hungry for money from the National Rifle Association that we won't consider the safety of our children. There's no need for us to have citizens walking in the streets with AR-15s and assault weapons, when our children are being gunned down when they go to school, something has to give. These are injustices. Uh, the futility of politics, the futility of wealth, how we put our trust in money, but money can fail. And if money was your foundation, it will soon crumble and what is left. God tells us that we are not to build up earthly treasures because moth and dust can come and corrupt and steal them, but heavenly treasures last forever. It talks about the futility of earthly wisdom. We might think we know, but there is only one wisdom, and that wisdom comes from God. 
So we have to understand that. And we don't have a clear picture of what uh, our meaning is, what the meaning of life is. We'll live a pretty cynical life. We'll live a life of folly, a life of insignificance, a life of frustration. And this frustration can be felt. If you ever have the time, sit down and read through Ecclesiastes. You'll see a person who's just questioning some things and bringing up some powerful points and talking about the futility of life outside of the right sense of purpose. And so he gets to the conclusion of the matter all the way down in Ecclesiastes cha chapter 11. He kind of brings his observations, his cynicism, his frustration, and his quest for meaning into, watch this now, a final concluding statement. And it's a powerful one, and it really helps us. He says in Ecclesiastes chapter 12, verse 13 through 14, he says, now that's the whole story. He's concluded his observations. He talks about the folly, how meaningless life apart from God's will and his way can be. And he says, here now is my final conclusion. That's Ecclesiastes chapter 12, verse 13. He says, here now is my final conclusion. Now, here we go. Fear God, obey his commandments, for this is everyone's duty. Uh, some translation says the whole duty of man. Verse 14, God will judge us for everything we do, including every secret thing, whether good or bad. Isn't that amazing how he summarizes the meaning of life? What does it all mean? And I'll say it again. Fear God, obey his commandments, for this is the whole duty of man. This is everybody's duty. Fear God. Reverence God as our creator and sustainer. This tells us who we are, and here's the thing. It tells us we're covered. He is our God. When we say fear, it's not quake. It simply means to reverence him. That's what life is all about. When we have this sense of understanding that God is our aim, and I want to kind of look at that word aim. When we have a sense of meaning, that means we have an aim. That means it gives us purpose. We have a sense of intent. We have a desired outcome in our mind. That's everything in life. What am I laboring for? What am I fighting for? Here is a better way to put it. What am I aiming at? Without the word of God, without his ways, uh, that the God that created you, life is aimless. Think about this. You ever know somebody that seemed to have no direction? You ever uh, really looked at someone who seems to be going through life aimlessly? Let's be honest with ourselves. Have you ever had seasons and periods of time in your life where you felt like you were wandering through life aimlessly with no sense of meaningless, uh, meaning? Well, Coelho tells us that the meaning of life is to fear God, to reverence him, to worship him, to honor him, to keep him first, to recognize he's our creator. And as he's our creator, he's our covering. As he's our covering, he's our protector and our provider. And that we are to obey his words. That means that there are principles and precepts that should govern our life and give us a target. And when I think about aim, uh, one of the greatest things examples that I can give that helps us kind of understand this is when you're target shooting. One of the most important things about a shooter or hitting a target, is the first thing you have to understand is you have to identify the target and then align yourself with it. And so if you've got a bullseye, I don't care if it's close or a mile away, that target, you have to align yourself with it and understand that if I'm aiming, the first thing I have to do is identify the target. Choose your target. What am I aiming for? Well, as Christians, we're aiming for this, Christ-likeness. We're not supposed to be like Oprah. We're not supposed to be like President Obama. They're great people, but they're not our aim. They're not our target. Uh, you can have mentors. You can have people you look up to, and they can give you great inspiration and great information to lead to great manifestation in your life, but they're not the ultimate target. The ultimate target, the ultimate target for our aim is Christ. He is the gold standard for all humanity. He is the one person that has no flaws. He is the one person that let us send this life on this earth for 33 and a half years. He is the one who is our target. His way, his mind, his life, and his purpose. That's the example that we should all aim for. That's the target. Now, any shooter will tell you, you can identify the target, but if you don't have a good technique, you're going to miss every time. One of the things that we have to understand that uh, a technique in shooting, you have to have a good grip. 
You have to have a good stance. You have to have good breathing. These are all part of technique. All this has to happen, watch this, before a shot is taken. And, and that's the powerful thing about guys who can shoot well under pressure is being able to do all of those things. And it comes to target technique, and then here it is, mastery of tension. Because the most important thing, you can identify the target, which is Christ-like, Christ-likeness, and then you can have a technique, grip, you can have the stance, but our technique as Christians is love and righteousness. How do we do things? We do it God's way, but you also have to do it in love. That's the greatest commandment, love God, love one another. That's the technique. But in shooting, the target's there, the technique is right, but if you have the wrong, watch this now, mastery of tension, and what is that in shooting? The trigger pull. That one thing, squeezing the trigger, most people jerk or pull. If it's not smooth to the point that you're pulling the trigger to the point that the bullet fires and it's a surprise to you, then you're going to get out of alignment, you're going to jerk, you're going to move, and you're going to miss your target. But having a good trigger pull means you can pull slowly, you got your breathing in place, and you've mastered tension. And you can fire the gun, pull the trigger without moving the pistol or the gun at all, and you hit your target. That's target, that's technique, and that's mastery of tension. We can apply that to our life. We want to win in life. We got to have a target. That's Christ. What's the meaning? We're all trying to be like him. What are we after? Sharing his love walking in righteousness. More specifically, we are called to reconcile men back unto him. We are his representatives and we are to do it because the righteousness of Jesus Christ was, watch this now, imputed to us by our faith. It was a gift and we receive it through our connection with him. There's a way to do it. No man comes to the Father except by him. So we love one another. We follow his principles and precepts. And in the midst of it, we have a target, Jesus. We have a technique, love, but we have to master tension because trouble going to come. Challenges are going to come, but you got to be smooth with your trigger pull. I, I just want to put it in the urban way that kids talk about it today. When it comes to living a life, we got to learn how to shoot our shot. How do you shoot your shot? Let go of all the vanity around you. Let go of all the fear, all of those things that don't mean anything, and pursue a life. Watch this now that God has ordained. Go after him with everything in your heart. And when times are stressful, when there's tension, stay smooth at the trigger. And when we live that way, that's winning. That's winning. I want you to leave this place. I want you to leave this time thinking about the meaning of life. It's very simple. Reverence God, fear him, honor him, watch this, and keep his commandments. And do that, and I've got a sense of aim. What's my target? Jesus. What's my technique? Love. What things should I master? Tension. Because if I can keep it steady, shoot my shot, I'm going to hit the target. And that's winning in life. I hope this blesses somebody. I hope this puts you on the right path. I hope this prepares you. I want you to transfer this in every area of your life. Life is vanity without meaning, but God has given us meaning. Love him, honor him, obey him, follow his principles and precepts. I've given you the perfect target to be like Christ. I've given you the technique, love and righteousness. And I've told you that through your faith and your steadfastness, watch this, master the tension that's gonna come your way. And shoot your shot. I guarantee you'll win. God bless you, beloved. I hope this was a blessing to you. Let's get ready to thrive. Join us as we celebrate our seniors and their gifts to the ministry of I Thrive Christian Church. This celebration of service will take place during our 10 a.m. service Sunday morning, May 6th, for Senior Sunday at Charles Drew High School. 6237 Garden Walk Boulevard, Riverdale, Georgia, 30274. Come ready for a real celebration. Summer is coming. With summer comes food, family, and fun at our I Thrive Family Cookout. Saturday, June 2nd marks the date for our second annual I Thrive Family Cookout. Last year was a blast. Great music. Lots of food, lots of fun activities, and great fellowship. Mark your calendars and get yourself ready for our I Fry Family Cookout, Saturday, June 2nd. Stay tuned. More details coming soon. The third annual Staple Awards.
America's Church Homecoming, acknowledging pastors and soldiers on all levels. Saturday, April 21st at New Light Church, located at 3592 Flat Show. This Road. year's honorees, Bishop William E. Schill, Pastor T.J. McBride, Bishop Greg Davis, Reverend Dr. Gregory A. Sutton, Bishop Donald E. Battle, Overseer Andre Lander, Apostle Franklin D. Battle Sr., and Dorothy Norwood. And performances by J.J. Harrison and Youthful Praise. Isabel Davis. Charles Butler and Trinity. David Walker and High Praise. 1K Fruit. Angelina Cherie. And hosted by Griff of the Get Up Morning Show with Erica Kelly. It's the third annual Steeple Award. For more information, visit www.thesteepleawards.com. I pray. We cry.